Stated Clearly presents What is really meant by survival of the fittest? When Darwin wrote his famous book about the process of evolution by natural selection, he filled 502 pages with new insight and careful observations. In spite of all his care, when people think of natural selection, a single phrase often comes to mind. Survival of the fittest. It's a catchy bumper sticker description of the process of natural selection. You might be surprised to hear that this phrase wasn't actually in the first edition of Darwin's book. Instead, it was coined by one of his fans, and somehow it stuck. Sadly, catchy as the phrase may be, it has caused confusion over the years. Its emphasis on survival suggests that evolution is all about either living or dying. In reality, evolution has less to do with death and more to do with how well an organism reproduces. More specifically, how well an organism passes its genes on to future generations. Now, if you die before reproducing, that usually is a sure way not to spread your genes, but death is not the only way to fail. If Badger Mother A raises three pups to maturity, while Badger Mother B only raises two, Badger A is the evolutionary winner, at least by a little bit in this round of the struggle for existence. This is true even if she then promptly dies, while Badger B is somehow granted immortality. Provided, of course, that she's no longer able to reproduce. From a human perspective, death might seem essential for evolution. Each of us will die, whether or not we have children, but the same is not true for all life forms. Bacteria, for example, reproduce by copying their genes and then splitting in two. If we assume they've been reproducing in a similar way since the beginning, this means that any individual bacterium you meet today has never had a single ancestor die since the origin of life. Even still, any given individual, human or bacteria, is only temporary. The things that really survive in survival of the fittest are an organism's heritable traits. We now know that many traits are coded for by genes, sequences of information usually stored in DNA, sometimes RNA, that are physically passed from parent to child during reproduction. Genes are the things that survive. Next, we have the word fittest. Is this supposed to mean physically fit, as this image falsely suggests? The answer is no. Maybe it means strongest or largest? Well, if that were the case, how did tiny mammals survive the extinction of the mighty T-Rex? Clearly, it is not true that only the strong shall survive. Maybe fittest here means most indestructible. If that's the case, then solid rocks seem to be among the fittest things on Earth. Surely, we've misunderstood something important here. As Darwin so famously pointed out, the fittest traits are those which best help an organism pass those traits on to the next generation. Traits that might be a great fit in one environment might not be so great in another. Fitness is context dependent. Now, if you plan to master the field of evolutionary biology, you should probably study the diverse ways in which fitness is talked about, modeled, and measured by researchers. The concept of inclusive fitness is especially interesting. It turns out there actually are ways to spread copies of your genes, even if you don't directly reproduce. That said, if you really just want a clear, foundational understanding of evolution, there is a different bumper sticker description of natural selection that I find more helpful. Those which happen to be better reproducers tend to reproduce better. You might be thinking that is so basic, it feels silly. Simple as natural selection might seem, when combined with heritable reproduction, the ability of an organism to pass its traits onto its offspring, and combined with variation, variation generated by things like random mutation, recombination, and so on, the end result is the process of biological evolution, a process so powerful that it alone, so far as we can tell, produced the eyes you are using to watch this video and the brain you are using to understand these words. Those which happen to be better reproducers tend to reproduce 
better. When I say those which happen to be better reproducers, I mean that some individuals will be unusually good at reproduction because they happen to have undergone a random mutation or other heritable modification that increased their odds of survival and reproduction within their specific environment. Even though survival isn't directly mentioned here, it is implied because reproduction is difficult if you happen to be dead. When I say they, quote, tend to reproduce better, I mean that on average, they will reproduce better. A bit of bad luck can still take you out of the game, no matter how well matched you happen to be to your environment. Okay, let us test drive this new bumper sticker with some real world questions. First off, why are there more crows alive today than peacocks? Because those birds which happen to be better reproducers tend to reproduce better. Why is a new coronavirus strain becoming more common than the original coronavirus strain? Because again, those viruses which happen to be better reproducers tend to reproduce better. That is it. Now, obviously it does require serious research to uncover the details allowing one bird species or one virus strain to reproduce better than another, but our seemingly silly bumper sticker does point our brains in the right direction. No fluff, no distractions. Those which happen to be better reproducers within a specific environment tend to reproduce better within that environment. How well do you think the number of views for this video will reproduce within its YouTube environment? 